appreciate everybody attending this uh, uh, Wednesday evening session. And of course, uh, we have the benefit of this technology through Zoom to be able to do that. So, but I'd like to, to sort of remind you that in the not too distant past, you know, I presented a lesson entitled, What Must I Do to Be Saved? I remind you of the uh, biblical events with which you are well familiar that gave rise to this question being raised. If you look at Acts uh, 16, chapter verses 16 through 34, there we see that Paul and Silas, they got into a, a bit of a pickle when Paul, annoyed by a slave girl uh, possessed with a spirit of divination, commanded the spirit to come out of the girl. <clears throat> but this uh, slave girl brought her masters much profit. When upon Paul's command, the spirit of divination was expelled from the slave girl, her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, chapter verse 10, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, he and Silas were about to find out firsthand the truth of this statement. They were thrown into prison and chained, but their chains were loosened after an earthquake. The jailer responsible for their confinement was uh, prepared to take his own life, assuming that all the prisoners under his charge had escaped. Paul implored the jailer not to harm himself and informed him that all the prisoners were there, uh, still there. Well, upon learning this, the jailer fell prostrate before Paul and Silas <clears throat> and asked the, the question that all should ask, but few do, what must I do to be saved? The analysis and answer to that question is instructive to all accountable persons, which prompted me to prepare and present that lesson on what must I do to be saved. <clears throat> I would say that another question is equally important, or, or at least one that should uh, seriously be considered is, what must I not do to be saved? Perhaps we could just say that if one were to obey the things that one must do to be saved, then that would obviate the need to enumerate the things that one must not do to be saved. Then we could just conclude this lesson here and go on to other things. But it is uh, useful and certainly in the nature of preaching to point out the things that people do but shouldn't that prevent them from being saved or otherwise pleasing to the Lord. And we can point out uh, uh, that Christians should not do certain things enumerated in the New Testament such as uh, Galatians 5th chapter verse 19 through 21 where Paul is recorded to say now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery fornication uncleanness lewdness idolatry sorcery hatred contentions jealousies outbursts of wrath selfish ambitions dissensions heresies envy murders drunkenness revelry revelries and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, these are certainly things not to do if one is to be a faithful Christian, but we shall consider tonight other things that one must not do to be saved, that is, to be forgiven of alien sins. As pointed out in my lesson, what must I do to be saved? The imperatives presented there were not ordered to be exhaustive, nor can the prohibitions presented here be considered exhaustive. Also, some of the things to be avoided do overlap. Uh, treated here are just some of the things that one must not do to be saved. 
And I don't doubt at all that you're fully capable of adding to the things that I enumerate here. Also, the order presented here uh, is not to imply that one sh should take precedence over the other. All are important since any one can prevent a sinner from being sanctified. First, one must not imagine that he has nothing to do. The Philippian jailer understood that he must do something. The thought had not occurred to those of Paul's time that they could be saved without doing anything. It just naturally occurred to sinners of Paul's day that they must do something. That is why the jailer asked the question. If people imagine that they have nothing to do and carry this thought in, on into eternity, they will never be saved. Falsehood and lies do not save the lost, but the truth of the gospel. Romans 1st chapter, verse 16 and 17. Yet many today pretend that they and all men will be saved whether they obey the gospel or constantly ignore or outright refuse its call, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Yet the night approaches when no one can obey, John 9, verse 4. Further, one should not err in identifying the things one must do. As noted in my previous lesson, the duty required of sinners is very simple and would be easily understood were it not for the false ideas that pervade the denominational doctrines about the exact being things God requires as conditions of salvation. One must not say or imagine that he cannot do what God requires. God is not willing for anyone to perish, but wants all men to come to repentance. Second Peter 3 verse 9. And who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, verse 30. If God placed impossible demands that one must obey to be saved, it could not be said that he desires all men to be saved. Neither could Jesus have made the claim he made as recorded in Matthew 11, verse 30. Furthermore, Jesus excoriated the scribes and Pharisees as recorded in Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. The weightier matters, quote unquote, were just as readily attainable as the tithing. But the scribe and Pharisees simply did not want to fulfill the weightier matters of the law. Such is the case today that accountable people are able to do what is required to be saved. They just choose not to. Another thing that one must not do is that bane of human good intentions and goals, procrastination. Probably no other mode of evading present duty has ever been so pervasive as this character trait. It is a destroyer of good works and of souls. If one imagines that this life is all that there is, then as Paul said, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 32. Jesus spoke a parable about a certain rich man. This is what he had to say. Then he spoke a, spar a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build a greater. 
and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? That's in found in Luke 12, chapter verses 16 through 20. And it's likely uh, that the rich man was industrious and conducted his business with due diligence and attention to the necessary details. Unfortunately, he put off holiness and obedience to some undetermined future date that never came. Whether he ever intended to become obedient, uh, we do not know. But he delayed until there was no more time. Many, perhaps, think there will be a second chance at salvation by some method or action never mentioned in Holy Writ. As well elucidated by a recent lesson presented by Brett Bailey, there is no second chance after death. One cannot reasonably expect salvation to occur when one has done his utmost in this life to delay, ignore, and ultimately reject the very thing that would secure his salvation. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 2, uh, that God said, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So we have uh, received divine help. Procrastination destroys the benefit of divine help. It is a murderer of the soul. Satan cares little whether one puts off obedience for a short time or, or a long time. Time works to his advantage. No doubt Satan prefers an extended period of procrastination, but he has a reasonable hope that a short delay will result in an extension of, of the delay and another and another until time ends. I would say to the sinner, if you ever mean to render obedience to the gospel of Christ, you must resist and aggrieve away the spirit of Satan, else you will grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption, Ephesians 4 verse 30. One of the most uh, memorable examples of procrastination is found in Acts, the 24th chapter, verse 25. The meeting between Felix and Paul included, among whatever else that might have been discussed, an intelligent argument in support of the gospel and the necessity of rendering obedience to it. Felix knew what Paul was saying. There it is recorded that now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call you. Well, did the procrastination by Felix result in being lost eternally? Well, likely. He had the opportunity to obey and the evidence on which to obey. Yet he deflected and procrastinated. Perhaps Felix was just too busy at that moment or had too many things on his mind to render obedience to the gospel if he ever intended to do so. Perhaps he was waiting, uh, waiting for a more favorable time to do so, or, or as he said, a convenient time. We all have pressing matters uh, that demand our attention. Do not imagine, as Felix perhaps did, that you will ever have a more convenient or favorable time to obey than right now. Felix did not say that he would not obey the gospel. He was just waiting for a convenient time. When that convenient time came, he would 
call for Paul. The question that must be asked and answered is just what constitutes a convenient time? Considering eternal consequences and the uncertainty of life, what does a convenient time look like? For those in need of the salvation offered by the gospel, when will your convenient time come? Is the gospel call a matter of convenience? There are those in torment this day who are still waiting for that now never to be realized convenient time. The words stated by wisdom so long ago are as true today as when first recorded. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. That's found in Proverbs, the first chapter, verse 24 through 28. And it's uh, really part of a larger reading of verses 20 through 33. So as I quoted previously, now is the day of salvation. Another thing that one must not do to be saved is to wait for God to do what he commands you to do. God has done all that is possible to be, done, to be done for your salvation. Yet it is your disposition of mind and course of life that allows him to accomplish your salvation. That is his desire for your soul. Also, it's the very same thing that prevents him from accomplishing his desire for your soul. From the time of Adam and before, uh, whatever the before consisted of, he anticipated what was needed for you to be reconciled to him. He gave his son to die for you, thereby providing you with a means or avenue of atonement. His providence has given you the highest possible evidence of his existence. He has given you the requisite knowledge in his word of what one must do to access that atonement. God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 9, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 3, 2 Timothy, Timothy 2 verse 11 to 13 and so forth. Those in, in our audience, at least those of accountable age and condition, should know that God will not be negligent on his part. Please note there are things for you to do that God cannot do for you. Those things that he has enjoined upon you and revealed as conditions of your salvation, he cannot and will not do himself. The reason he asks you to do them is because he cannot do them himself. He has asked every sinner to render obedience to the gospel. These are personal matters. It is naturally impossible for anyone else, including God, to do those things that are incumbent upon you to do and that only you can do. No other being in heaven on earth or from hell itself can do these things in your stead. You will not be saved or condemned because of what someone else did or did not do. You are in complete control of your eternal destiny. You recall the account of the rich man in Lazarus found in Luke 16 chapter verses 19 through 31. Well, the rich man had it uh, pretty good, whereas Lazarus was in dire straits. Yet the rich man was only concerned for himself. After both died, Lazarus rested in Abraham's bosom, 
whereas the rich man was in torment. The rich man appealed to Abraham for relief, but there was none that can be offered. Then the rich man implored Abraham to send Lazarus to his five brothers to warn them of the judgment to come. Abraham declined to act since God had already provided everything the five brothers needed to be, be approved of God. So it is with us. One must not seek refuge in lies. Lies are so pervasive in the religious landscape of today. And this is not peculiar to our times. It has always been the case since the time of Eve Lies cannot save you. It is truth alone that is the word of God. John 17, verse 17. The gospel of Christ. Romans 1, 16. That's the only thing that can save you. If you are to be sanctified, then it must be through the truth of the gospel. John 17, verse 19. You cannot be saved by error, but only by truth. Satan, the father of lies, would have you believe, believe otherwise, John 8, 44. The devil intends for his lies not to save you. And unless you resist the devil, he will not let you be saved, James 4, verse 7. Do not wait out of consideration of what others will think, say, or do. It is instructive at times to understand another's reasoning for obeying or rejecting the gospel. But salvation is as personal as, as anything can be. Whatever the reasoning, reasoning process of others may have been, each accountable person is individually amenable to the gospel and must individually come to a knowledge of what one must do to attain salvation and must individually obey the gospel or individually reject it. As the writer of Proverbs 9th chapter verse 12 said, if you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Do not reject the laws of logic. Yeah, you had to know that I'd uh, slip this in here somewhere, but, so here it is. Laws of logic prescribe the, the correct chain of reasoning between truth claims. For example, taken from our study of logic, consider the argument, if it is snowing outside, then it must be cold out. It is snowing, therefore it is cold out. This argument is correct because it uses a, a law of logic called uh, modus ponens. I'm sure you remember that. If P, then Q, P, P, therefore Q. Laws of logic, like uh, modus ponens, are immaterial, universal, invariant, abstract entities. They are immaterial because you can't touch them or stub your toe on one. They are universal and invariant because they apply in all places and at all times. Modus ponens and the other laws of logic, including laws of thought, work just as well in Africa as they do in the United States, and just as well on Friday as they do on Monday. And they are abstract because they deal with concepts. Laws of logic stem from God's sovereign nature. They reflect the way he thinks. They are immaterial, universal and variant abstract entities because God is a immaterial entity. He's a spirit. He's omnipresent, universal. He's unchanging, invariant. And he has all knowledge. Colossians 2 verse 3. So thus all true statements will be governed by God's thinking. They will be logical. The law of non-contradiction, for example, stems from the fact that God uh, does not and cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 
2, verse 13. The Christian can account for laws of logic. They are the correct standard for reasoning because God is sovereign over all truth. We can know some of God's thoughts because God has revealed himself to us through the words of scripture and the person of Jesus Christ. Then thus one can employ the laws of logic to validate any truth claims that the Bible makes respecting what one must do to be saved and what one must not do to be saved. One must not embrace human philosophy as a substitute for or to qualify the truth of the Bible. <clears throat> human philosophies are far too numerous to be treated in this uh, short presentation. In a broad sense, philosophy is, a, is an activity people undertake when they seek to understand fundamental truths about themselves, the world in which they live, and their relationship to the world and to each other. Everyone has a philosophy of life, or as we sometimes say, a worldview by which they uh, make or try to make sense of reality. Uh, but most don't realize it and could not articulate their worldview, world even if they were to seriously think about it. Yet most will not accept that the answers to these philosophical questions are provided by the Bible. Has human philosophy developed theories to answer these inquiries? Well, yes, indeed. As an example, and although it's not intended to be the only example, the theory of evolution is an attempt to provide a plausible explanation as to how the present reality came to be. In doing so, evolutionists, in articulating their philosophical explanation of the now, quote unquote, must account for the antecedents on which current reality is predicated. Then they must account for the antecedents of the antecedents and so on into eternity. However, they are forced to acknowledge, uh, which they do not, that there must be an infinite number of antecedent events. To deny this, which philosophically they must, is to admit that there is a first cause for which there is no antecedent. Thus the Bible so declares, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For a comprehensive discussion of the philosophy of religion from a human perspective, I refer you to Charles Tolliver's Philosophy of Religion in the Stanford University Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And if you do access that uh, article, you better be prepared for an excruciating headache. Is such an appeal to human philosophy new to our modern age? Well, no. In Acts 17, verse 16 and following, we have the account of Paul in Athens encountering certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who queried, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Well, being the philosophers that they were, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, wanting to know about this new doctrine that Paul taught and what it meant since it was new to them. All the Athenians and the foreigners who were there at the Areopagus spent their time in nothing else but engaging in philosophies. Yet when they, they were told the truth about Jesus and his resurrection, they rejected it because it, it did not fit their pre preconceived philosophy of reality. Christ and Paul both warned about following the commandments and doctrines of men. Matthew 15, verse 9, Mark 7, verse 7, Colossians 2, verse 22, uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, and Hebrews 13, verse 9, maybe other places too. 
men have by and large uh, rejected the truth of the Bible and the gospel and embraced the philosophies of men as a substitute. In doing so, they have rejected the one philosophy that is able to save their souls. As the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul so eloquently and succinctly wrote, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans, uh, first chapter, verse 16 and 17. In summation, the one thing one must not do to be saved is to reject the very thing through which God operates to save the individual, the gospel of Christ. What one must do proactively to be saved, one must hear the gospel, believe in the Christ of the gospel, be convicted that one has transgressed the law of Christ, and from the heart repent thereof, confess publicly that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God the Father, be baptized for the remission of sins, and arise to walk in newness of life. Appreciate your kind attention and hope this has been useful to you. Thank you.